We're going to continue with our intimacy begets liberality. We're going to look at some things that Jesus taught. One thing you must remember in your Christian walk is that everything has an end. It's as a man plant a seed. It's called sowing and reaping. Everything produces an end result. Everything. So here's the end, receiving the end of our faith. So when it comes to money, one of the hindrances as far as coming against your giving or being liberal is covetousness. And in this world system, money is devoted because money is so often devoted to what kind of end? In this world system, you're going to have a stingy, and self-seeking. People usually devote it to ends that bring forth this. This is the end in the world system. You're going to be stingy towards God, self-seeking in order to gratify your pleasures. Now, what Jesus did, because he knew this would take place, what he did, he lifted money to a higher plane where it can be transmuted. Transmuted means converted or transformed to heavenly values. Lay up your treasures, not here on earth with moth, thieves, break through and steal, but lay up your treasures in heaven when can't nobody take it. We want to look at some illustrations because we don't want this to take place. Your journey ends up where? In heavenly places in Christ. Rapture takes place. Jesus Christ comes to get us. We end up going back with him. Your end is to be in Christ. You will either be in Christ or you go end up being a partaker of this world system. So everything has an ending. One is carnal and the other is spiritual. And a carnal man cannot do what? Receive nothing from God. This in Christ, you have to operate in faith. God kind of faith. Your faith in me has made you whole. Come with me to 2 Timothy, the third chapter. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. And what days are we in now? We're in the last days. The perilous times have to do with people not being satisfied with being in their own sin alone. They want to draw somebody else in. I'm not going by myself. I'm going to bring you in with me. That's perilous time. They're not satisfied to say, well, Lord, it's my fault. What did I do or what I need to do? No, they want to get somebody else involved. That's how the enemy works. He wants to run this gamut, the circle, to infect you so you can infect somebody else and so they can keep on to destroy as many as he can. For men shall be lover of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, or we would say troublemakers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. This is where sensuality comes in, where it is works of the flesh. All this is works of the flesh. So that means that your five physical senses are going to lead you carnal minded. You'll have an end that's be without God. So we're going to look at some things, a warning against covetousness. Ministers don't realize it. Well, ministers in particular, because to whom much is given, much is required. You can't operate in covetousness. You cannot. Come with me to Luke 12 chapter. Look at verse 13. Now, this is a warning against covetousness. And one of the company said unto Jesus, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Now, if his brother got the inheritance, that means his brother was firstborn. The firstborn received a double portion and they got basically the inheritance. This was under the law. Okay, Jesus came under the law to redeem those that were under the law. So he's asking Jesus to override the law and speak to his brother for him to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus said unto him, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Jesus becomes judge and divider 
once you receive him as your Lord and Savior and you allow him to be a judge or an a divider, you allow him to be who he is in your life. So this man is more interested in Jesus going over here speaking to his brother and telling him to give me some of the inheritance. What's the cause behind it? Why would he come and ask Jesus to do that? Because he saw Jesus doing everything else, <laughs> healing, delivering, and doing all that. So he figured he could bring his problem, but he was under the law. And this is what the law said. Verse 15. And he said unto them, speaking to the, everybody, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Jesus placed no value on property. Jesus don't place no value on property or either personal rights. When you receive Jesus, you give up the right to yourself. He got everything fixed. So what? You trust him. He'll do what? Fight your battles. So don't get wrapped up in things down here. What did the scripture verse say? We didn't bring nothing here. It's an impossibility for you to take something back. You didn't bring nothing. How you going to take something back? Things are not a part of man. Man is complete without things. You came into this world naked. When you came here, you were complete already because you were chosen from the foundation of this world. So in Christ, your completion was already made. That means when you came here, he provided everything for you. I see you got to renew your mind and think that way. And he spake a parable. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself. If he thought within himself, what was he thinking? In his what? In his heart. He pondered this and he thought that this had become a part of him. Saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow. What? My fruit. Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and all my good. And I will say to my soul, so thou hast had much good laid up. Let's see what it said. Laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. See what kind of end he had? A stingy, a selfish end. Why? He was deceived in his security. You got to be careful where you lay money up. If you laying it up where God can't put his hand on it, or if you are not given unto the kingdom, given into the work of the kingdom, he had his stuff laid up for many years. He said, oh, take my ease. I'm going to eat and drink and be merry. His deception was in his security. God said unto him, thy fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So his covetousness breathes a short life and a fool's end. Some things you ain't going to say there's no God. But the things that you do, your acts, and what you don't do speaks. Actions sometimes speaks louder than words. There's no God. Not in my life. See, they got certain things that you do. You're telling people. You're actually fooling yourself. So he says, so is he that laid up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So covetousness is forbidden. Come with me to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. It is forbidden. Look at verse three. But fornication and all uncleanliness, all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becoming saints. While we over here, we go look at the fact that being covetous can damn your soul. Look in verse 5, Ephesians 5 and 5. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Let no man deceive himself. Don't let nobody deceive you with vain words either. With that said, come to Hebrews 13 chapter. Verse 5, let your conversation be without covetousness. The way you live your life, the way you order your behavior, let it be without covetousness. Well, what is covetousness? Wanting and desiring something wrongfully, trying to get something the wrong way. Ain't but one way for the Lord to give you anything. And that's about what, Jackie? By faith. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Why? For he has said, I never leave you nor forsake you. You have to renew your mind to this. When you need something, 
and you got all the bases covered and you go to the Lord and you talk with him, you can say he is your helper. But if you're in any kind of fear, the faith will not work. If you got any kind of fear, afraid of losing stuff, afraid of this, or afraid of, I'm talking about real fear. Faith won't operate. Just won't operate. Lord, is there any fear in me concerning? Is there anything that I'm afraid of, that I have fear, like something is going to happen to me, or I'm going to lose this, or this is going to happen? Is there any fear? If it is, Lord, let it come up so we can what deal with it. We're co-laborers together. He knows what degree to bring something up so as not to make you devoid of hope or believing. He knows what degree to bring it up to. And you know when you go through something, the Lord said, oh, you can handle this. Else he wouldn't let you go through it. It wouldn't even come to you if you couldn't handle it. Come with me to 1 John. We're looking at covetousness is forbidden. 1 John, second chapter. Remember now, covetousness breeds Breeze what? Temptations and snares and lusts. You operate in covetousness, it'll bring forth other things, undesirable things. Even with Cain killing his brother. Brings forth murder, brings forth all kind of detriments. Just by being covetous. Because it's a wrongful desire and you don't care how you get it as long as you get it. First John 2.15 Love not the world. See right here? This world system. The end of it. If you're operating in stinginess or self-seeking or carnality, you are not in Christ. You won't have no faith. You won't have no spiritual attainments or achievements because you can't have both of them. You're going to be either or. You can't straddle the fence. You either serve the Lord. As far as me and my house, we go do what? We're going to serve the Lord. Now, I don't know about your house. You got your home house. Then you got your own individual house. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, okay? Things that are in the world. Cars, houses, property, clothes. Love is only for God. The word love, I know it's phileo, brotherly love, Philadelphia. Aries, a motherly type love. And agape is a God kind of love. The love that you should have for God, you don't have that for nothing else. You can't let nothing take that affection from out of your heart. God has to be that. The love of God is shared abroad in your heart for a reason. It's for him and your neighbor. Love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, thy mind, thy soul, and thy strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who is my neighbor? The one sitting next to you or across the way from you. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's as clear as day. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And what's going to happen to the world? It's going to pass away. The lust go pass away. But if you're doing the will of God, who is my mother, my brother, and my sister? Those that do the will of my Father. He says that you abide forever. Now, there must be a hatred of covetousness because it is one of the qualifications of leaders. If you are a leader on your job, supervisor, you govern yourself, you can't have covetousness. Whether you are a Christian or a secular leader, even though all our leaders said that they are Christians, but no covetousness. Because why? You have to stand before the Lord. Let's go to 1 Timothy, third chapter. First verse, this is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desired a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Everybody here ought to be able to teach, teach the word of God. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre. That means unrighteous gain. In other words, I'll get up here and preach money out your pocket into my pocket. That would be merchandise in my ministry that the Lord gave me. The Lord know the heart of that person he puts in the pulpit. You'll be tested as to whether you're covetous or not. You'll see something that you might want. I really want that. It belongs to somebody else now, and you want it. I ain't talking about going in the store and you see something you want. I'm talking about something that belongs to somebody else that you don't have a right to. What if you want it? Why can't you go to the Lord in prayer and talk to him about wanting something rather than start planning on how you can scheme and connive and get it? Don't we have that in this world system today? Yeah, probably in the church too. Not a brawler, not covetous. 
One that ruled well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. If a man know not how to rule his own house, how can he take care of the church of God? Not a novice. Lest being lifted up with pride, he falls into condemnation of the devil. The devil will pluck you dry if you do not know who you are in Christ. He'll bring you all kind of innuendos, tell you you don't have this, you can't do that. And most time, if you're not renewing your mind with the word of God, you will listen to him. You'll just listen to him and give him credence. Let's go to 1 Peter. You got to hate covetousness. 1 Peter, 5th chapter. Now, see, basically, those were Christian leaders. That was a Christian leader, what we just got through ministering on over there in 1 Timothy 3 and 3. The elders which are among you I exalt, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. If you do not suffer with Christ, you will have no glory. If you do not suffer for righteousness sake, when persecution and affliction rises for the word's sake, if you don't know how to hold your ground and stand and you cave in because of the pressure, you got to go through the suffering. Now, the Lord ain't going to let nothing come on you that you can't bear. So when it comes to you, you go, hey, he let this come to me. I know I can handle this. I got his strength. And so you what? You bear up under it because he that holding it up. He ain't even touching you. He got it. And you full of joy. Joy unspeakable, full of glory. You laughing out loud because you already know what? The end. Because where? You're in Christ and it's a spiritual warfare going on. And he said, I have already overcome the world. All you got to do is walk in light of, oh, he's already overcome this. He's already paved the way. Piece of cake. Peter speaking to him. He said, feed the flock of God, which is among you. If you're going to feed the flock of God, it means to shepherd. The duty of a pastor is tending, feeding, guiding, and guarding the flock of God. You are the flock of God. And let's do this. And the first thing it starts with is prayer. So my job is to feed you, taking the oversight thereof, or overseeing and taking care of the spiritual part of your life, the spiritual care of the flock. That's my job, spiritual care. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre or dishonest gain, but of a ready mind. What do you mean a ready mind? Ready to distribute? As the Lord and the Spirit of God tells me or teach me or to feed you or whatever the case might be. Neither as being Lord over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. I'm not a high-handed autocratic. What that mean? Being absolute, laying down the law, high-handed. This is what y'all go do. That's autocratic. There's no love in it. There's no Jesus in it. It's laying down Sister Lilo. That's autocratic. Absolute. God put me here. Taking no account. The Bible says what? Submit to one another. Sister Candace might say, Sister Lee, I need to talk with you about something. Such, such, such. Oh, okay. God, I don't want to hear that. I'm laying down the law. They have people like that, but they subtle with it. You don't know. They know how to get around and lay down the law and con you at the same time. We want the Holy Ghost to knit y'all to Sister Lee here. <laughs> So we can be a happy family, (laughs) a happy camper. (laughs) And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that faded not away. See, this is the end. This is why you do what you're supposed to do, because you want to receive a crown of glory. You don't want to see no other crown. You want to hear, well done, that good and faithful servant. All right. If you operate in covetousness, it will damn the soul. Sometimes soul is used in exchange with your spirit. A soul meaning the whole person. But your soul, your will, your emotion, intellect, reasoning, that is the mediator between your spirit and your body. I pray above all things that you, your spirit man, May it prosper and be in health, that's your body, as your soul prospers. So that's the totality of man. So now, you can damn your soul if you operate in covetousness. Let's come to 1 Corinthians 5 and 9. I wrote unto you, that's what Paul said, in an epistle not to company with fornicators. You have spiritual fornicators, and if you're spiritually a fornicator, you might end up being a physical fornicator. Fornication against 
God his covenant. That means being hooked up in relationships that God didn't put you with. Even friends, you got to be careful because evil communication corrupts good manner. It's either of God or it's of the devil. It ain't no in between. Yet not all together with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters. For then must you need go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if a man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, which such and one know not to eat. Because good manners do not rub off on bad manners. It's the other way around. When you pray for a person, you ought to be praying for these people on your job. You ought to be praying for quote-unquote friends. And so you with them, the Holy Ghost can actually let you see things about their character. He will. So you'll know. No, nobody have to tell you. You'll know. Oh, Lord, help me. I don't need that person as a friend. I just don't need them. Thank you, Lord. You are in a business and you go to business meeting and go out to dinner. That's, we ain't talking about that. We talking about hanging buddies. That's what we talking about. We go look at covetousness must be killed out. Covetous must be killed. K-I-L-L-E-D. Out. Where is that in the Bible? Colossians, the third chapter. You got to take covetousness and choke it around the neck. Colossians 3 and 1. If you then be risen with Christ, and we know we are risen with Christ, the minute you receive Jesus as your Savior, you were introduced into his death, burial, and resurrection. You do not have to do anything but receive Jesus as your Savior. You are placed in the body of Christ as an adult, a son of God, by the spirit of adoption, You are placed in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. All because you said, Jesus, come into my heart. You didn't have to do nothing but what? Believe. And believing is a work of God. He furnished everything. He furnished the word. So when you heard the word, grace came to you for you to receive Jesus Christ as your who? Righteousness. Because grace can only reign through what? Righteousness. So you had to receive Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God. I am risen with Christ. This is three and one. Give you a little example. I am risen with Christ. Therefore, I seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. I set my affections on things above and not on things on the earth. All the power that you need is in these words to change if your affection is the wrong way. You keep saying this. The word is see. It'll be planted in your heart character, and before you know it, your affections will be on things there above. For I am dead. Verse 3, I'm dead. I can't die no more. I'm already dead. It's appointed to man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Well, you're being judged every day. So it says, for I am dead, and my life is hid with Christ in God. Now, you got a confession right there already. You ain't got to make nothing up. All you did was change it and made it personal. Therefore, I put to death. My members upon this earth. What do I put to death? Fornication, uncleanness, inart affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God coming on the children of disobedience. So you got to put to death covetousness. Anything that's not of Christ, you got to put it to death. How? With the sword of the spirit. With the word of God. Prayer. Your confession. Your word. Not calling things the way they are. But quickening the dead by calling it the way, what? The words say. Say what the words say. Say what the words say. Say what the words say. The world say you're lying. But God said, no, you're not. You're speaking the truth because you're speaking me. First Timothy, sixth chapter, sixth verse. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment. He said being discontented, mumbling and grumbling and complaining. It says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness is a possession. If you in Christ, you possess a godly piety that respects and reverence God. You give him credence. In the containment of that is what's called a self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency. 
you and God being co-laborers together. So with your reverence and respect of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the Father, in that it's a supernatural element of self-sufficiency. Well, my sufficiency is of God. It's not myself. Well, remember over in John 17, chapter, hold your place here, we go come back. The Lord wants all of you. He wants every ounce of you. I wish I didn't have this body. It's a hindrance. No, your body is your glory. God made your body. What did Jesus come down and partake of? Flesh, bone, blood, body. It's not your body ain't your problem. It's the renewing of your mind with the word of God. Your body is not a shameful thing. Your body ain't did nothing. It's just housed. It's the Holy Ghost. 1717. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. As thou hast sent me into the world. See, we've been sent into the world. We're not a part of the world. We've been sent into it. Even so have I also sent them into the world. And, underline this and put little stars by it. And for their sakes, look what it said now. And for their sake, I sanctify my who? Myself. I got a sanctified self. If Jesus sanctified himself for me, he said, I sanctify myself for their sake. The only problem is the old man. That's the only problem. Ain't nothing wrong with yourself. As men as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Ain't nothing wrong with you. It's only when you allow your five physical senses to dictate to you and outward circumstances that don't have anything to do with God but this world to dictate to you. Then the stuff starts coming in if you fall under the prey of it. But other than that, in Christ, ain't nothing wrong with you. Hey, Jesus said, for hearly sake, I sanctify myself. Why? That she also might be sanctified through the truth. That herself might be sanctified through the truth. You read that whatever Jesus got, you got. Because he got it for you. Then we find out obeying the truth purifies the soul. Faith purifies the heart. Believing is a work of God. Because the believing got to be anointed by the Holy Ghost. If it's that way, you know it's going to come to pass. And don't care how long it takes, because you're living in it. Come to Ecclesiastes, fifth chapter. See, we've been called into fellowship. Just like a father and a child on earth enjoy being together, so we must have this intimate fellowship with the Lord every day. Every day. This is personal. And there's a joyfulness of each day as you fellowship with him. There's a renewing, or it's like being born again all over. Every day is like a new day. And so a life of faith is a life of obedience. You want to operate in faith? All you do, obey the word. That's all. Let's start with verse 15. As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor which he may carry away in his hand. This is when I was telling you that when you come into this world, you are complete. The world can't add nothing to you. There is nothing in this world that can add something to you. If you chose from the foundation of the world, you were complete in Christ then. He already made every provision for you. And then when it comes to food and clothes, that's the protection for the body. That's the outward protection. He already provided that. It's, don't take no thought what you go eat or what you go wear. I already made the provision. Now, look in verse 18. Behold that which I have seen. Now, believe it or not, this is our obligation. You're obligated in this because it says right here, all the days of his life. So now he's not dealing with things in eternity. He's dealing with things in time, T-I-M-E, all the days of your life that you hear in time. He says, it is good. You know, if it's good, it's right with God. It is good and comely for one to what? Eat and to drink. And to enjoy the good of his labor that he take it under the sun all the days of his life, which God give it him for it is his portion. So then there is a sufficiency already proportioned out to me. Godliness with contentment, there is a sufficiency in that, a self-sufficiency, but God gave it to me. When you go to work, God intends for you to be in a position for you to enjoy your labor. He didn't intend for you to live from paycheck to paycheck, did he? Thank God for faith. You can't go buy nothing, can't buy a hamburger if you wanted one because something else is due. That was miserable. I've been there. I got paid. And by the time you paid the bills, 
Even when you paid your tithe and paid your bills, you didn't have nothing. Lord, how long is this going to last? Unbelief. But as I grew, you see, you got to stay with it. It looked bad, but it wasn't bad. He had to get stuff out of you, covetousness, pride. My dear, I need $20. My dear, I need some gas. I give it to you when I get paid. You understand what I'm saying? These are things you go through to get out of you things that you have about money you shouldn't have. The last time I asked my mother for money, the Lord told me, don't ask her for no money, no more. I said, well, Lord, I need to pay JoJo and them school stuff or they go put them out. He told me, go ahead and get your money from your mama. I got it from her. Now go down there to the post office and take out a loan for that amount and pay your, your mama money back. And don't ask her for money no more. That's why some things you just don't say nothing about. You just leave it alone. You listen to what the Lord say because people can talk you out of it. You don't have to go borrow it. I know what the Lord told me. That was the easiest loan I ever paid back. Because what? I obeyed what he said. But he was trying to get me to quit going to your mama for money when you can get it from me. And you ain't got to pay nobody back. So sometimes you go through stuff to get stuff out of you. But you got to believe that the Lord is working for your ultimate good. Don't care how bad it's looking. Because what else he got? Nothing but good. What would I look like now being up here ministering to you and going through that? No. If you know how to stand your ground, it's the days of wine and roses, baby. Because God already has made the provision. All you got to do is stand your ground. You know you're paying your time. And every time an opportunity presents itself, you give. And what the word said, God is able. It ain't say you was able. It said God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you are what? Sometimes. Uh-uh. Not always. Sometimes. He said always. Always is always. Have all, all, all what? Sufficiency unto every good work. You got to have your mind renewed to that. If you don't, you'll take on a poverty spirit. But now he said eating and drinking. Remember said Jesus came during what? Eating and drinking? <laughs> Didn't he say that? Now, eating and drinking are of the proper thing. See, this is what you got to do. And you got to keep it within the bounds of God's law and the best for your help. You just can't go out there and do the do because it says eating and drinking. You got to keep it within. He said, give us this day our daily bread. You know what that means? Give me for this day my portion. And give me somebody else's portion. (laughs) No, give me this day. See, it's temperance. Temperance is a fruit of the spirit. You got to have self-control in every aspect of your life. So we'll pick this back up. Amen.